This rocket was created to answer the greatest challenge of the 20th century. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. I thought he was nuts. <laughs> Technically, it was unbelievable. There was going to be some serious problems on the way. Reaching the moon will require a rocket of immense power. The mighty Saturn V. This is a kind of power that you really cannot wrap your brain around. To succeed, those involved will push engineering to the limit. They must overcome catastrophic failures. There were massive problems with it that just were overwhelmed. And do it all within a decade. The goal, to build a rocket to send men to the moon. This is the story of the unsung heroes who built the Saturn V. December the 21st, 1968. Astronauts Frank Borman, Bill Anders and Jim Lovell prepare to embark on a daring mission. They hope to make history by becoming the first humans to leave Earth and orbit the moon. That means risking their lives on board the first manned launch of the giant Saturn V. We weren't going just to Earth orbit. We were going to the moon and back, 240,000 miles away. Engineers have built a rocket weighing almost 3 million kilograms and containing over 3 million parts. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. If we had a failure, it, the damage can be overwhelming, and of course the crew's chance of survival is very minimal. 10, 9, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have to We have off. The clock is running. The story of the Saturn V begins here in Huntsville, Alabama. In the 1950s, the city becomes home to a group of German engineers with a specialist skill, rocketry. During the Second World War, they are responsible for developing the V-2 rocket, the world's first liquid-propelled missile. They're led by the charismatic Werner von Braun. But when Nazi Germany collapses, von Braun and his team surrender and are eventually brought to Huntsville to work on America's fledgling rocket program. For 12 years, they design rockets for military use, including the Redstone and Jupiter. Then, on October the 4th, 1957, the Soviets launch Sputnik 1, the world's first satellite. The space race has begun, and the USA is trailing. For rocket engineers like Don Binns, it's a bitter blow. I remember you'd you'd listen to Sputnik going around and going beep, 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 and, and it says, gosh, they beat us, and we'll have to really get, get our nose to the grindstone and move ahead and see if we can't catch up. All right, command, all right, command. Hey, hey. In 1958, Von Braun's team successfully launched America's first satellite, Explorer 1 on board their Juno rocket. But Von Braun is targeting a much bigger goal. And he believes he has the team to achieve it. Among them is Army engineer Jim Odom. Dr. Von Braun was uh, one of the most remarkable men uh, I've ever known. He was a, 
a great leader. He was a very good engineer. And the team that he brought over here was absolutely outstanding. Von Braun's team have been developing a pioneering series of liquid-propelled rockets called SATA. Von Braun always had his eye on bigger and bigger booster rockets that could launch larger and larger payloads into space. And he tried to solve that problem by taking smaller rockets and clustering them together. And that was the basis for the very early Saturn rockets. April 1961, the Soviets launched the first man into orbit, Yuri Gagarin. For President John F. Kennedy, it's the final straw. He ups the stakes dramatically for America's rocket engineers. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Don Binns and his colleagues are taken aback. When I heard him make that announcement, we, we all watched it on TV and thought he was nuts. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it's an amazing challenge. Um, technically, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. We just needed someone to step up and, and say, let's go to the moon, because we were competing big time with the Russians. Kennedy believed in us. In fact, he came to the Cape, Von Brown took President around, showed him the Saturn being tested. Von Braun comes face to face with the man who set this seemingly impossible goal. And the question he asked Von Braun was, are we going to beat the Russians to the moon? Von Braun said, yes, Mr. President, we're going to beat the Russians to the moon, and we're going to do it within the time frame you set. End of conversation. This is the challenge Von Braun has been waiting for. And teams of engineers across America begin work on a mighty moon rocket. So there were several different approaches, and each one has some technical disadvantages and technical advantages. And I would say Von Braun was uh, probably the primary influence on what was actually selected. The initial plan is to use a method called direct ascent. Assemble an enormous rocket and fly directly to the moon. Then land a large spacecraft on the lunar surface before blasting off and returning directly to Earth. It seems simple enough, on paper. But engineers soon realize that building such a giant rocket by the end of the decade simply isn't feasible. Von Braun favors a different method, but finally decides on a technique known as lunar orbit rendezvous. Head to the moon with a smaller spacecraft, one that shuttles the astronauts to and from the lunar surface, while a mothership waits in lunar orbit. The final element is a rocket, powerful enough to take men to the moon. And this is what we call the Saturn V. And the takeoff weight of this uh, monstrous rocket will be about six million pounds or 3,000 tons. At the Davidson Center in Huntsville, the rocket's huge size can be fully appreciated. This is one of the three Saturn V's, painstakingly restored to a pristine condition by the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. They are the largest artifacts in the institution's collection. After a multi-million dollar restoration project, they now take pride of place at displays in Houston, Huntsville, and at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Looking at them, it's possible to understand a key engineering principle Von Braun uses to create such a powerful rocket. The Saturn V isn't one rocket, it's three, stacked on top of each other, known as stages. Staging uh, was, was a big deal in rocketry. 
Stage one will use a cluster of five giant F-1 engines to lift the 2,800-ton rocket to a height of 68 kilometers before separating. The booster drops away, and then the second stage ignites. Stage two will use five smaller J-2 engines, boosting the rocket to 185 kilometers above the Earth. And it drives the vehicle up near the edge of Earth orbit, and then the third stage kicks in. Stage three has just one J-2 engine. And that puts the spacecraft and the third stage in orbit. Before igniting a second time. And the reigniting of that third stage was a big deal because that puts you on a path to the moon. But no rocket this big or powerful has ever been built before. Meeting Kennedy's deadline will push the rocket engineers to breaking point as they prepare to take on one of the greatest engineering challenges the world has ever seen. At 110.6 meters tall, even today, the mighty Saturn V rocket is still the largest rocket ever built. At the very heart of this beast is the F-1 engine. Restored by the Smithsonian Institution, an example stands with other Apollo artifacts in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. This fully renovated Saturn shows that the mighty rocket has a cluster of five F-1 engines powering the first stage. Myron Pessin is one of the first stage engineers. The biggest engines we had built up to that time were 200,000 pounds of thrust. This was a million and a half pounds of thrust. Each engine is six meters long, 3.6 meters across, and at around nine tons, is heavier than a school bus. Five of these engines will fire the rocket and three astronauts to a height of 68 kilometers. So they must be rigorously tested and become man-rated. To qualify uh, the F-1 engine we call man-rated, we required 500 successful starts, which means you have to fire a lot of engines. Test firing the cluster of five F-1 engines presents a huge challenge. So engineers construct giant stands in Huntsville and at NASA's Mississippi test facilities on the banks of the Pearl River. Ron Tipu is involved in the test firings here in Huntsville. The engines would have gone up on level 10, which is at where this, those two holes are up there. But to ensure the test stand isn't engulfed by searing rocket exhaust, engineers construct a giant deflector that can withstand the blast and direct it sideways. If they all five fired down through that aspirator and the heat came out and deflected up about 500 feet out and 100 feet in the air. This deflector is cooled with water from a pump house that supports this test stand that can, has a capability of 280,000 gallons of water per minute. April 1965. Engineers prepare to test fire the cluster of five F-1 engines that will eventually power the Saturn V's first stage. Ed Buckby was NASA's press officer at the time. I was called in and, uh, by my boss, and he said uh, the Life magazine is sending their photographer down to cover this test fire. He sets up his camera. I said, you know, when it does ignite, you're going to see this huge ball of fire come out of the engines, and it, for a moment, there won't be any noise. And all of a sudden, the sound will hit you and you're going to feel the vibration in your chest. Uh, the heat will come up your, up, up your pants leg, and it's, it's really uh, rather scary when the first time you see one of these. He looked at me and said, young man, I've covered fires, uh, tornadoes, wars, floods. I, I think I can handle this. at the photographer, he had 
turned and was running across the field away from firing and test, and he never got one picture of the firing of the Saturn V booster. The firing of these engines has a profound effect on the people living in neighboring Huntsville. Uh, you could feel uh, the, the ground vibrate uh, some distance away, uh, several miles away, I'm told. But if we were getting cloud cover, what would happen was the, the, the sound would go up, ricochet back down somewhere in, in the city. We would have people calling about uh, windows broken uh, and, you know, chandeliers uh, shaking and coming apart. But it's not just the windows that are shattering. Testing quickly uncovers a critical problem with the F-1, one that's causing them to catastrophically disintegrate in seconds. Reaching the moon within the decade will remain a dream unless engineer Sonny Morea and his team can fix this flaw. It was the program's showstopper. We would not have gone to the moon until we had a fix on that. We would not risk the astronauts on that vehicle when we had an engine that could blow up underneath them. This became a big enough issue that we were concerned that we were going to impact uh, the goal that was set to, to get to the moon in the decade. A team was put together to solve this problem that put the best minds together from around the world. Sonny and his colleagues pinpoint the cause. Well, combustion instability is a frequency that gets set up whenever anything burns. One of the ways to think about it is if they're familiar with a candle burning in a room, you know that the candle flickers during the burning. That part of that flickering is the fact that it's unstable, that the fire is unstable. Like the candle, Liquid propellants injected into the rocket chamber burn in an unstable way, creating powerful shock waves that rapidly oscillate until the force shakes the engine apart. Finding a solution will take America's top engineering minds the best part of two years. Well, we went to a process that involved the use of baffles. Now, if you look at the face of the rocket engine in here, the face of the injector, you'll notice there are several compartments. It works like this. Instead of the propellants entering the combustion chamber as regulated jets, the baffles interrupt the flow, subtly changing the way they ignite and reducing combustion instability. The first stage of the Saturn V is back on track. The second is taking shape on the other side of the country, at Seal Beach, California. But the engineers of North American Aviation are way behind schedule. The engineers who were building the second stage of the Saturn V found themselves in a kind of a squeeze. The first stage of the Saturn V had already been defined, and the third stage had also been designed before the second stage was even being developed. There was this constant battle to save weight, and the burden fell on the engineers who were designing the second stage. The second stage must lift astronauts to a height of 185 kilometers. It has to be incredibly powerful, yet incredibly light. When complete, just 9% of its total weight is metal. 91% will be liquid propellants. They had to find every way they could possibly think of to save weight in that stage, thinning the metal to the point where you really sort of worry, is this, is this okay to do? Many months are spent skimming every last gram of metal from stage two, but it's still not enough. Engineers need to find another weight-saving solution quickly stroke of genius that they came up with was to do what was called the common bulkhead. 
If you look inside the second stage, you've got one tank for liquid oxygen and another tank for liquid hydrogen. And those two tanks take up a certain amount of space. Somebody realized, what if we could merge the two tanks together and create a single curved divider between them? Having a common bulkhead reduces the height of the stage by almost three meters and sheds an impressive 3.6 tons of weight. It's a breakthrough for the stage two engineers, but the schedule has slipped even further. Kennedy's deadline looks unachievable. And in November 1963, NASA ups the pressure. Against the wishes of Von Braun, NASA shortens the schedule by removing several of the team's test launches. Their concept was that you would launch the Saturn rocket with one live stage and two dummy stages on its first mission. If that worked, then the next time you would add a live second stage, you'd still have a dummy third stage. And if that worked, well, then you could launch all three stages as live stages. But NASA now want to accelerate the launch schedule and test the live rockets all at once. The first batch of launches, Apollos 1, 2, 3, and 5, will use Von Braun's smaller Saturn 1B rocket. The Saturn 5's first unmanned flight will become Apollo 4, followed by a second unmanned launch, eventually called Apollo 6. The first Apollo astronauts will finally fly into Earth orbit on Apollo 7, and Apollo 8 will send men to orbit the moon for the very first time. That was a, a big change for us uh, here in Huntsville. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a lot of work because that means that we're going to have to retest the stage, we're going to have to recertify it, make it man-rated. That was a big step forward, big step forward. The clock is ticking and the engineers are about to face disaster. Because the Saturn V is so large, Werner von Braun and his team of rocket engineers design it to be made of three individual rockets, or stages, stacked on top of each other. This method of rocket building allows each stage to be built by a different aerospace company. But developing space technology means entering uncharted territory, and that can be risky. On January the 20th, 1967, the Douglas Aircraft Company is testing a third stage prior to delivery to Cape Kennedy in Florida. Don Brinker is the man in charge. It was the third vehicle that was coming through our facility for a static firing. And that's when we load it with propellants and we go through a normal countdown. We were just getting ready few minutes from actually firing the stage. Not only does the team lose an entire third stage, but also the test stand suffers major damage. January the 27th, 1967. While engineers investigate the failure of stage three, preparations are made for Apollo 1. Slated to be the first manned Apollo mission and the first in American history to carry three astronauts into space. Today, they're performing a routine countdown test. We got three guys in a spacecraft, pressurized, suited up. Across the country in California, Don Brinker is investigating his stage three failure. He calls Cape Kennedy. I was on the phone. Uh, we, were, we were talking about some of the things that we were looking at, and when he said, Whoops, wait a minute, we got a problem. Something's going on here on the capsule. I can't talk to you anymore, and then blank the phones went. Unbeknownst to Don, during the call, a fire breaks out in the command module. Astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee 
are killed. NASA concludes that the likely cause of the fire is faulty wiring, which created a spark. In the pressurized, oxygen-rich atmosphere of the command module, that spark became a raging fire in a matter of minutes. For all involved with Apollo, it's a brutal reminder the smallest mistake can have devastating consequences. I think the Apollo 1 fire was a shock uh, to the guys that were close to the program. Again, they, uh, they were so confident that th these things were going to fly successfully. The Apollo schedule slips again as NASA redoubles its efforts to improve safety. But for the engineers at Douglas, it's valuable time to understand what caused the catastrophic failure of their third stage. Like Apollo 1, the culprit is tiny, a weak solder weld on a helium tank. January 1967. The three stages of the first Saturn V are finally ready for assembly and they arrive at Cape Kennedy. The challenge now is stacking them together. This is NASA's giant vehicle assembly building. It's something like 525 feet tall. On occasion, it had its own weather. And there were times, and I saw myself, where there were actual clouds up there. All the stages came in through this south entrance. Part of the structure are the, the huge overhead cranes. They would handle several hundred tons with such intricacy. Uh, could, if you were lowering one of them and you touched an egg laying on the floor, it would sense that resistance before breaking the egg and stop. The first Saturn V is assembled with breathtaking precision. But it's still a 5.6 kilometer drive to the launch site. You open those big doors, those 450 foot doors, and roll that thing out. And now that's where you really drew a crowd. This is the crawler, the largest moving land vehicle ever built. It needs a team of 30 engineers and technicians to drive the 2,800-ton rocket and its launch tower on a road trip that lasts up to 12 hours to the furthest launch pad. Houston flight now confirms that they are go for the flight, as are all other aspects of the mission. November the 9th, 1967. Apollo 4 is poised for the first unmanned launch of the Saturn V rocket. Engineers have spent millions of man hours trying to meet Kennedy's deadline. 13. Ignition sequence starts. Five, four, we have ignition. I think uh, people were shocked with, this, with the power and the size of the Saturn V. When you watch a Saturn V launch and realize that you've invested a, a part of your life, uh, when you realize that it's really going to work, the gratification level is just uh, outstanding. After just two and a half minutes, the first stage separates perfectly. The second stage takes over. It's amazing how long you can hold your breath. We had ignition on the second stage and ignition was good and all our flight parameters were essentially perfect. After that, you know, I was able to breathe again. The spacecraft sends a constant stream of telemetry from thousands of individual readings to the flight directors and engineers. So far, it's working exactly as planned. 
Stage three ignites for the first time, and then for the second time. The mission is a complete success. The next Saturn V to be launched is Apollo 6, and after that, a manned Apollo 8. After today's launch, what could possibly go wrong? T minus 60 seconds and counting. First stage now pressurizing. We're coming up on the power transfer in a matter of seconds. Status board still indicates all is well. Five months after the triumphant launch of Apollo 4, NASA prepares to bring President Kennedy's goal one step closer with a second unmanned launch of the Saturn V, Apollo 6. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. We have commit. We have looked at. From the ground, it looks like a perfect launch. We have cleared the tower. We have cleared the tower. But the engineers know something is very wrong. Telemetry shows the rocket is vibrating in a violent up and down motion. It's known as the pogo problem. I was told we had pogo. Pogo is a vertical oscillation, like a pogo stick. Senior project engineer George Phelps has seen the pogo phenomenon before. The pogo problem was very serious. The crew module, which was unmanned, experienced somewhere between 8 and 10 Gs of force, which, had there been crew aboard, could have killed them. Next, stage two. Five minutes into its burn, there's more bad news. Engine number two begins to sputter and lose thrust. Then it shuts down altogether. Moments later, engine number three also shuts down. We've lost uh, engine two and engine three. The engineers can only watch in horror. You've lost the engine? That's permanent. Roger. Roger, we, could, we think we have two engines out. Don't get nervous. Right on that. This stage is designed for one engine out. And there were two engines out. The onboard computer tries to save the rocket. The computer said, hey, you guys are in trouble. And uh, it started to lift the vehicle back onto a vertical, more or less, vertical trajectory in order to get the third stage and the, the crew module into orbit. IGM seems to be bringing it in, flight. Roger. I'd say it's look and go, flight. The team prepares to fire the third stage engine for the second time to send the command module on its designated trajectory. But it doesn't light. All three stages of the rocket have had critical problems that must be solved before it can fly again. The pogo problem with the first stage occurs when vibrations in the engine's thrust and combustion chambers match the natural vibration of the rocket in flight. They amplify each other and generate vibrations up and down the length of the rocket. Fortunately, the engineers discover a solution. We put dampeners, a dampener, to absorb these vibrations to make them safe. It doesn't get rid of them necessarily, but it minimizes them. It's like a shock absorber in your car. But what went wrong with the second and third stages is a mystery. Telemetry reveals a sudden drop in fuel pressure on both engines. It's a telltale sign of a fuel leak. And it's traced to the failure of the engine's fuel igniter lines. But how could the engineers have missed this? What they had missed with those J2 engines was that they were always being tested at sea level, where the moisture in the air would form a coating of ice around the propellant lines. And that actually ended up giving them extra resilience, extra strength against those powerful vibration forces.
Once you got up above most of the atmosphere, there was no moisture, there was no ice, and it shook the heck out of those fuel lines and caused the problems. If the stage two and three J2 engines failed because of a weak pipe, why was the number three stage two engine shut down? As engineers, we pulled out all the block diagrams and the schematics and all that stuff. And a guy, he said, you know what happened? I think those wires were crossed. It's the simplest of mistakes. The wiring for engine two and engine three has been crossed, meaning the onboard computer sent a signal to shut down a perfectly healthy engine. Von Braun and his team have solved all the problems discovered by Apollo 6. October the 11th, 1968. NASA successfully launches Apollo 7. The first manned Apollo mission uses the smaller Saturn 1B rocket, placing its three astronauts in Earth orbit for 11 days. But Von Braun and his team are ready to go much further. They understood their system. That's what allowed them to have the confidence to say, we're gonna fly people on the third Saturn V, and once you put people on it, it doesn't matter whether you're gonna to go to Earth orbit or go to the moon. So let's go ahead and do it. December the 21st, 1968. Astronauts Frank Borman, Bill Anders, and Jim Lovell are about to put their lives in the hands of the engineers who built the Saturn V as they set out to become the first humans to fly around the moon. Mark, T minus three minutes and 30 seconds in the counting. We've completed our communications checks with the Apollo 8 astronauts in the cabin and the communications are go. With the lessons learned from Apollo 6 and the successful first orbital flight of Apollo 7, NASA is ready to reach for the moon. Engineers can only sit and wait as the three-man crew of Apollo 8 prepares to make history. 35 seconds and counting. You know, this was the first time that we had huge turnout of the press. It was, it was huge because, number one, first time we had a crew on the Saturn V ever. Secondly, we weren't going just to Earth orbit. We were going to the moon and back, 240,000 miles away. 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have, we have lift off. As Apollo 8 thunders from the pad, its crew were the first to experience the awesome accelerating force of the mighty F-1 engines. Apollo 8 Houston, you are go for staging, over. This time, both stages work perfectly. Uh, Houston, are you Apollo 8? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear, Apollo 8. Okay, the first stage was very smooth, and this one is smoother. Understand. Smooth and smoother. Looks good here. Hearing the crew talk while on that rocket was a really a moving experience. We had to keep telling ourselves, these guys are going to the moon. This rocket's taking these guys to the moon. And this had never happened before. All five J-2 engines fire flawlessly, accelerating the astronauts to almost seven kilometers a second. Apollo 8, Houston, your trajectory and guidance are go, over. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, you're looking real good, Mike. Very good. We began to hear things like uh, second stage shutdown. OK, so you know second stage is shut down, and then they would they'd announce separation third stage. It, it actually is another one of those whew, a sigh of relief. S4B ignition. Guidance initiate. 
After less than two Earth orbits, the engineers take another deep breath. It's time for the three men to be fired to the moon. The critical maneuver called Translunar Injection, or TLI. We're sort of uptight because you have to accelerate the vehicle to 24,000 miles an hour to escape the gravitational forces of the Earth. If the burn is a success, the path of humanity will change forever as the crew of Apollo 8 become the first people to leave Earth's orbit. All right, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. All right, you are go for TLI, over. Roger, understand, we're go for TLI. The whole program now rests on this single engine burn. Ignition, Roger, ignition. That was a very profound moment because it was a major step in, this, in what we hoped was going to be space exploration. As Apollo 8 and its crew head for the moon, the engineers on Earth who dedicated their lives to building the Saturn V reflect on a historic achievement. I had given birth to that baby and I remember, you know, looking out at the pad and it was gone and I thought, God, the love of my life has gone away from me and she'll never come back. The success of Apollo 8 paves the way for the first lunar landing, Apollo 11, in July 1969. The Saturn V engineers have beaten Kennedy's deadline. But the Saturn V's work isn't over. It successfully launches seven more missions, six to the moon, as well as America's first space station, Skylab, in 1973. Today, the Saturn V rockets restored by the Smithsonian Institution draw large crowds. But preserving their engineering legacy has another important mission, to inspire a new generation of rocket engineers. Pushing out into the solar system, not just to visit, but to stay. Now, last month, we launched a new spacecraft as part of a re-energized space program that will send American astronauts to Mars. To achieve these bold ambitions requires the development of an extraordinary new rocket. Called the Space Launch System, or SLS for short, it will be even more powerful than the mighty Saturn V. R.H. Coates is one of the engineers working on its design. The Space Launch System owes a great deal to the legacy of the uh, Saturn V. One of the key enablers for the Saturn V was to utilize the lightweight liquid hydrogen uh, propellant. That legacy, that learning uh, to design those high performance upper stage engines also went into the Space Launch System. We are definitely standing on the shoulders of giants by what we learned from the Saturn Apollo. Only a few of the original engineers are left to appreciate the impact of their achievements as mankind continues its quest to break free from the confines of our planet and head out to the stars. In the 1960s, the dream of a generation comes true. The has landed. Human beings walk on another world. Arriving there in an incredible spacecraft, the Lunar Module. It looks like something that came from outer space. It turned out to be a bug. Creating the Lunar Module is the ultimate engineering challenge. If your ascent engine doesn't work, you're dead. Simple as that. It takes ingenuity and dogged determination. The technology we had was crude compared to uh, what exists today. There was always difficulties and problems. From risking lives on Earth, to saving lives in space. 
This is the story of the unsung heroes who built the world's first spacecraft to land humans on the moon. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The lunar module is an engineering marvel. The ultimate Winnebago, made from 48 kilometers of electrical wiring, half a million rivets, and ultra lightweight skin not much thicker than kitchen foil. It may look an unconventional flying machine, but it's the culmination of millions of man hours of engineering prowess. It was ugly, but it was beautiful in the fact that it was, not an ounce was wasted. It's all form follows function. Between 1969 and 1972, the lunar modules carried 12 Americans to the moon's surface on six Apollo missions. They are the spacecraft that make the dream of a generation come true. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. May 1961. Spurred on by the Cold War, President Kennedy delivers to NASA a seemingly impossible engineering challenge. To land the first men on the moon. At the time, Glyn Lunny is a young engineer at NASA. We were thinking, wow, that is really an incredible goal to set. And our minds immediately turn to, how are we going to do that? It's all the more incredible, as America's only spaceflight experience happens just weeks before the president's announcement. We just barely got Al Shepard up, and he flew a couple hundred miles in the air and came down. Astronaut Alan Shepard's short suborbital hop lasts just 15 minutes. Now the goal lies 386,000 kilometers away. Kennedy's dream inspires some of America's brightest young engineers, like Marty Finkelman, Nobody knew for sure whether we could do it. And Stephen Rocamboli. Everybody in the world was looking, what are the Americans doing? Before anyone can set to work, NASA must make a critical choice. What's the simplest and most achievable way of flying to the moon? When the problem of landing on the moon really became serious and they had to look at it, um, the natural assumption is, look, it's right there, let's just go there and land. This no-nonsense approach uses one giant rocket in a method dubbed direct ascent. The rocket must be powerful enough to carry everything needed to reach the moon, including a big, heavy spacecraft over 21 meters tall that lands on the lunar surface and then lifts off again to fly back to Earth. But as engineers like Jerry Sandler are quick to point out, direct ascent has a major flaw. Direct ascent required a great deal of thrust and a booster larger than anything we could have even imagined at that time. Building a rocket this large and powerful is likely to make Kennedy's deadline impossible. NASA needs an alternative solution. They explore a riskier method called Earth Orbit Rendezvous. This requires not one new giant rocket, but two smaller rockets, each launching part of a spacecraft to be assembled in Earth orbit. But two rockets means double the risk of a failure at launch. NASA must make a decision quickly. Enter young aerospace engineer John Hubolt. He's working on a radical idea. So radical, it hasn't been given the attention it deserves. 
John Hubold was the guy who said, look, you guys aren't thinking about this properly. Every time I brought this in front of you, I've been dismissed. Hubold rejects direct ascent and Earth orbit rendezvous in favor of a more swiftly achievable method of getting to the moon. His unpopular idea is called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, or LOR. It uses two small spacecraft. One, called the Lunar Module, descends to the moon's surface, while the other, called the Command and Service Module, remains in lunar orbit. Once the astronauts have finished on the moon, the top stage of the Lunar Module returns them to rendezvous with the Command Module before it's discarded. To Hubolt, the advantages of LOR are obvious. You need one less launcher, you don't need the giant impossible rocket, and you can dedicate the lunar lander to do the one function, this difficult thing that we've never done before, landing on the moon. But for NASA, LOR has a nightmare scenario. Lunar orbit rendezvous was very scary because if you miss the rendezvous, if this little ballet of spacecraft trying to join up doesn't work, you're dead. But Hubolt isn't discouraged. He gambles his career by going straight to the top. He writes a letter to one of NASA's senior executives. I fully realize that contacting you in this manner is somewhat unorthodox. Hubolt goes on to lambast his managers for dismissing LOR. His convictions evident in a copy of his letter. Wow, this is amazing. Yeah, you see this? I've been appalled at the thinking of individuals and committees on these matters. Hubolt lays it on the line and bluntly asks, do we want to get to the moon or not? I would say this letter saved NASA from failure of landing on the moon in time. As the clock ticks, NASA engineers finally accept the LOR method. And on July the 11th, 1962, they announce their decision. Over a year since Kennedy's speech, NASA is ready to choose a contractor to build the lunar lander and reach for the moon. One company stands out, the aircraft manufacturer, Grumman. In November 1962, they win the bid. But planning the lunar mission has cost precious time. Grumman engineers will feel the heat, spending the rest of the decade racing to get to the moon. A year and a half since Kennedy's promise to land men on the moon. Grumman engineers must turn their design for the lunar lander into a reality. They have a sterling record in constructing commercial planes and fighter jets. But now they face one of the greatest challenges in aviation history. Engineering a machine that flies not on Earth, but in space. The engineer's initial inspiration comes from a familiar flying machine on Earth. The winning design was kind of like a helicopter with little legs. And the little legs were small and they had little pads. Grumman's lunar lander seizes on the design of the helicopter for one critical reason. The astronauts must be able to search for a safe place to land. Almost nothing is known about the lunar surface other than it will be unforgiving and treacherous. A young pioneering rocket scientist, Gerard Elverum, would be crucial in finding a solution. There were a lot of speculation about what the surface of the moon was, whether there was six feet of dust up on the moon or whether it was a few inches. Engineers know it's going to be dangerous, they need to predict how the lunar module will react on touchdown and design everything 
to prevent a crash landing, which would leave the astronauts stranded on the moon to die. Engineers must help avert this worst case scenario. Being able to hover and spend some time finding where you want to sit down became very important. The astronauts practice in this, a NASA test vehicle dubbed the Flying Bedstead. It's inherently dangerous. Alvarum is challenged with designing a way to allow the astronauts to maneuver while descending to the moon's surface. His solution is to devise a spacecraft engine that can throttle. It was brand new technology. So these two valves here control the flow rate uh, coming from the tanks in, uh, in the descent stage. By controlling the supply propellant to the descent engine, the astronauts can control its thrust, allowing them to maneuver like a helicopter. But landing safely on the moon is only half the problem. The other half is building an engine to get them off the moon. It would be known as the ascent engine. The problem with the ascent engine, the difficulty was that it had to work every time. That's a single point of failure. If your ascent engine doesn't work, you're dead. Simple as that. Like the descent engine, the ascent engine must be as simple and reliable as possible. Fresh out of college with a degree in aeronautical engineering, Tim Harmon is tasked with the challenge. We had to keep it simple, and NASA realized that as well. Not a lot of complexity. Keeping it simple means stripping out as many moving parts as possible. Pumps, valves and turbines. But the engineers then face another challenge. If you rip the heart out of a rocket engine, how do you get it to fire? The answer lies with the fuel itself. You use propellants that don't need an igniter, that don't need a turbine, a bunch of moving parts to suck them in and then burn them. There are certain combinations of propellants that if you mix them, they uh, automatically ignite. One look at each other and they explode on contact. It's pure simplicity. Push the two propellants together in the engine's combustion chamber and bang. But using these self-igniting fuels comes at a cost. They're so corrosive that at the end of a test, each engine has to be rebuilt. It means the final assembly of an engine can never be tested. They'd build an engine and they would take it out to a facility that we had in White Sands, New Mexico, and they would fire the engine up. Now, after they fired the engine up, they would take the entire engine apart and clean it and reassemble it. That engine would not be refired again until it was on the mission. So when the astronauts use the ascent engine, they'll be gambling with their lives. These two engines control the two-part lunar lander. The descent stage, with its throttling engine, flies the astronauts to a soft lunar landing. And the ascent stage launches them safely back into lunar orbit. But Grumman's design is still in its infancy. As they begin to build, they soon start battling against every space engineer's enemy. Wait. Like the astronauts, the lunar module will be carried into space by NASA's mighty Saturn V rocket. But there's only so much it can lift. The problem is, the lunar module keeps getting heavier. 
the weight started to climb. We went 20,000 pounds, we went 22,000 pounds, 24,000 pounds. Uh, it, was, it was a constant battle. By October 1964, the Lem's weight has ballooned to a crippling level. Whenever you went to work, even if you made a change, everybody was saying, well, what's the implication for weight? It was there all the time. The Lem being overweight late in the program generated what I would call uh, a bit of a panic. Something has to give. So Grumman wages an all-out war on weight. Engineers start by shaving off every spare ounce of metal. We would be paid $40,000 a pound for every pound of material that we could scrape off. Every part of the lunar module's design is then reassessed. You wanted to have great visibility, so they had big windows. Now, glass is very, very heavy. The large windows are replaced with smaller, lighter ones. But now, the seated astronauts can't see where to land. Somebody came up with a brilliant idea. Why don't we just put restraints on the, on the crew and have them stand up facing the window and leaning over and get the same angles? While descending to the moon, flying, sitting down, or standing up makes little difference. It's an ingenious weight-saving idea. Engineers must then find the lightest materials possible for every part of the lunar module. The astronauts lived inside this air balloon made of metal, and this is the thickness of that balloon. The astronauts would be on this side, where there was oxygen. On this side was the deadly vacuum of space. Twelve thousandths of an inch thick is all that was. In all, the engineers shave off more than 900 kilograms and transform the appearance of their lunar lander. Gone are the helicopter-like windows and seats. Five legs become four. The circular hatch becomes square. Heavy panels are replaced with facets of thin aluminium. By 1967, Grumman has their spacecraft. But it hasn't even left the workshop. When it does, the pressure on the engineers skyrockets. June 1967. The first lunar module, LEM-1, arrives at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It's already months behind schedule. And before it can fly, the lunar module must pass NASA's stringent tests to see if it can keep two astronauts alive in the moon's lethal environment. When the LEM goes down to Cape Kennedy, you know what the first thing they do? They take it apart. Everything gets taken apart. What they find is a disaster for the Grumman engineers. The welds on LEM-1's fuel tanks and fuel lines have a critical problem. They opened it up, they tested it for leaks. It leaked like a sieve. They couldn't believe how badly it leaked. The tank's welds are riddled with microscopic holes. Grumman thought their welds were up to standard, but NASA's tests are more rigorous. Unsafe to fly, the lunar module is grounded. Well, it certainly causes embarrassment, and to have a setback like that uh, is, is serious. The weld repairs take the engineers three months, delaying LEM-1's flight further. Meanwhile, back at Grumman in New York, another crisis throws the schedule into disarray. It happens towards the end of 1967, during a pressure test. In December, lunar module number five, Eagle, the first one to land on the moon, its window blew out during a standard test. This was completely unexpected. I hear the LEM 
has had a window failure. Oh my God, had a window failure. Right away, I said, that would cause an astronaut to die. The window has a critical flaw, which was missed in the inspection. But the broken glass also poses a major threat. There's plexiglass and glass all over the interior of the lamp. There's, I could see, wires cut, nicked. A single shard could short-circuit the LEM's electrics, or worse, severely injure an astronaut if it's inhaled. And I am overwhelmed. I'm going, oh my God, what are we going to do? I said, uh, should we scrap it? But Grumman knows that scrapping a multi-million dollar spacecraft simply isn't an option. Instead, they have no choice but to try and save LEM-5. So NASA implements a meticulous cleanup job. And young engineer Steve Rocamboli is on the front line. We could not even see what we were cleaning at times. There were people with camel hair brushes and filter paper, and they would go like this and collect particles on the filter paper that were sent to a quality lab where our inspectors would count the number of particles and the size of the particles. NASA's criteria for cleanliness is agonizingly stringent. First, every inch of the spacecraft is photographed in detail. Then, every fragment of glass collected from each photographed area is removed from the lunar module, placed under a microscope, and precisely measured. If you had so many particles that are a certain size and density, then it would be a problem. After a three-month cleanup, NASA finally declares the lunar module is safe for its astronauts. As Kennedy's deadline bears down, the milestones come thick and fast for the engineers. The millions of hours they have spent on the lunar module begin to pay off. In March 1969, Grumman spacecraft is finally ready for its first manned test flight. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have We have Apollo 9 blasts off with three astronauts on board. In Earth orbit, the bug-like spacecraft practices undocking and docking with the command module. The island is about 370 feet. OK. The test is a complete success. Two months later, Apollo 10 takes the lunar module even further. This time descending to within 14 kilometers of the moon. Oh, very pretty. Now it's time to head all the way to the moon's surface. On July the 16th, 1969, Apollo 11 thunders skyward from Cape Kennedy. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Four days later, in lunar orbit, Apollo 11's crew powers up the fifth lunar module, Eagle, ready for its descent to the surface. Trying to go for undocking. Roger, Eagle, undock. Roger, how did it look? The Eagle has leaked. Roger, we go aft on the over. After seven long years, this is the opportunity for the engineers to beat Kennedy's deadline. Now their spacecraft must carry two astronauts on humanity's most dangerous journey. I was concerned about everything. The money was on the line now. We were going to the moon. Their worries are well-founded. 
Eagle's flight will be far from plain sailing. July the 20th, 1969. Astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin begin man's first journey to the moon's surface. Aboard their lunar module called Eagle. Now it's crunch time for the engineers who built it. Will Eagle withstand a lunar landing? Okay, everybody, let's hang tight and look for landing radar. The mission hinges on a computer to guide them down to the lunar surface. But it has just one megahertz of computing speed, over a thousand times slower than a smartphone. Such a small amount of processing speed could prove a showstopper. Program alarm. 12, 12.02 alarm. 12.02 is a computer alarm. Neither astronauts nor most in mission control have a clue how it will interfere with the lunar landing, including flight director Glenn Lunny. Oh, yes. I mean, it caused a lot of concern to people because they all knew that it was a risk to the landing. They had to decide whether to continue and land or whether they had to abort. They're within just 12,000 meters of the surface. But everything the engineers have worked for hangs in the balance. One navigation engineer, Jack Garman, knows what the 1202 alarm means. He's seen it before in a simulation landing. But what it amounted to was the computer was issuing an alarm that says, you are asking me to do too much. You, you have overloaded me, the small computer. There's no way of rebooting the computer to cancel the alarm. The question is, can the computer keep up and navigate a landing? If not, they must abort the mission. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Jack Garman is looking down at his little cheat sheet, and he realizes that this alarm problem is one that cropped up unsuspectedly earlier on in one of their test training places and realizes, oh, we can still keep flying, as long as it's this alarm. Jack Gorman said, ignore the alarms. Everything is OK. The vehicle is safe to land. We're, we're going on that flight. Jack Garman and the other young engineers save the astronauts from a last minute aboard. Eagle, Houston, you're a go for landing, over. Apollo 11 is back on track. Go for landing. The fragile spacecraft closes in on the lunar surface. But heart rates in Houston are about to rocket once again. As they looked at where they were supposed to land, they found that the whole terrain was filled with boulders and rocks. So Armstrong makes a crucial decision. He accelerates and flies horizontally to clear the boulder field, using up precious fuel. Fuel only. Fuel. Critical. Eagle's fuel gauge is critically low. But incredibly, unbeknownst to both astronauts and mission control, the fuel readings they're seeing don't match what's actually left in Eagle's tank. It all comes down to something called fuel slosh. Fuel slosh was an unexpected problem on the spacecraft. Because the tanks are round at the bottom and the spacecraft is moving around, the propellant is doing this kind of stuff. And there's a little indicator at the bottom that gives them an idea of when they're at low level. On Apollo 11, because of the slosh, it was uncovered about almost 40 seconds early. The indicators falsely show a low fuel level. But astronauts and mission control are unaware of the problem and in a race against time. That's 40 seconds less time for Armstrong to find a place to land, which was crucial for him. 875 feet, good down and a half. Engineer Dick Wilde, monitoring the life support systems, sees the drama unfold. A minute and a half remaining. A minute remaining. 30 seconds remaining. And the guys who were managing the fuel supply were jumping up and down, and one of them yelled out for everybody to hear, land the goddamn thing. I was sitting back there saying, 
I have to set it down, set it down. Don't bort the thing. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. We've had shut down. We copy you down, Eagle. And Gordy Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. They landed it with seconds of fuel remaining. That was excitement. In reality, Armstrong has 40 seconds more fuel than everyone thinks. To the engineers, it seems the astronauts have just escaped certain death. The feeling I had when it happened is, it's done. It never can be undone, you know. These are the first guys to land on another body from Earth. And you can't take that away from me. And it was my engine that allowed it to happen. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. A decade-long struggle for the lunar module engineers has finally paid off. But one engineer is still waiting with bated breath. Tom Moser designed the US flag for Apollo 11. I didn't think it was a showstopper. I thought doing something like that was uh, something that was pretty straightforward. Moser has engineered a horizontal pole for the flag, designed to stop it hanging limp in the moon's zero atmosphere. That rod um, had a an improper coating on it so it wouldn't extend all the way so it looked like the flag was waving in the breeze. The flag support pole is a little known engineering failure and leads many to believe the whole mission is a conspiracy staged here on Earth. There's no atmosphere, there's no wind up there so how could it be waving? It wasn't waving, it was just it was not able to earn furrow all the way. The astronauts explore the moon for just a few hours. Now comes the part engineers are secretly dreading. The moment the lunar module must help bring them safely home. If the ascent engine doesn't work, they'll be stranded on the moon. They just calmly said, Ignition, beautiful ride, everything was fine. Beautiful. 26, 36 feet per second up. Very smooth, very quiet ride. And that was totally not adequate to express the engineer's relief at that moment. It was really a big deal. Eagle Houston, to request manual start over ride. It went flawlessly. When Apollo 11 lifted off from the moon, our job was over. Pride was probably the word. I went outside and I looked up at the moon and I said, I have just witnessed history and I have been a part of history and I will never look at the moon the same way again. And to, that, to this day, that is still true. Apollo 11's resounding success makes history. The lunar module has performed faultlessly. But its greatest test is yet to come, during the most epic drama in Apollo's history. In April 1970, the lunar module is heading to the moon on Apollo 13. On board are astronauts Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert. The goal is to explore the lunar highlands. But 56 hours in, Apollo 13 suffers a crippling explosion. 
engineers in Houston, including flight director Glenn Lunny, face their nightmare scenario. Somebody turned around to me and said, uh, Glenn, you better get out there. When I got back in, all the panels had warning lights on them, and a lot of them were blinking red. I mean, it was like somebody turned everything upside down. The service module is losing power and bleeding oxygen. We are, uh, we are ready to out uh, into space. There is only one option, to abort the lunar landing and try to bring the astronauts safely home. Now we were 200,000 miles already out towards the moon. And so we knew we had to do things that we hadn't done before or even tested before. We knew we had to use the LEM as a lifeboat. We figured we'd get about 15 minutes worth of power left in the command module. With the command module out of action, the astronauts retreat into the attached lunar module, Aquarius. So uh, we want you to start uh, getting over in the LEM and getting some power on that. And uh, you ready to copy your procedure? OK. With its own oxygen and fuel supply, Aquarius is the crew's only hope of survival. But whether the lunar module can save them all comes down to the engineers. Immediately, they face a critical situation. We knew that the life support consumables aboard the lunar module were really only designed to keep two astronauts alive for 50 hours. That defined our problem for us. Now the lunar module must cope with three astronauts for 80 hours. The danger? The astronauts are slowly suffocating on their own exhaled carbon dioxide. Everybody knew immediately that we had to figure out something to do about the carbon dioxide because we didn't have enough carbon dioxide scrubbers, filters, to last us all the way back in the lunar module. One solution might be to use the CO2 scrubbers from the command module to filter the air in the lunar module. But there's a potentially deadly problem. The kind of failure that occurred had not been forecast. Their canisters were square, ours were round. Typical square peg, round hole problem. Only the ingenuity of the engineers on Earth can save the astronauts. The engineering guys came on and said, uh, Glenn, we already have a team of people working on that. We'll have an answer for you in several shifts. In just a few hours, they must do the seemingly impossible. Engineer an adapter that lets the command module's square filter operate in the lunar module, replacing the spent cylindrical one. But they can only use equipment that's available to the astronauts. It's a huge challenge. To improvise a low-tech solution and save the astronauts from asphyxiation. The engineer's design is ingenious. They use cardboard from reference manuals, plastic cut from a garment stowage bag, a spacesuit air hose, duct tape, and a sock. I said, hey, this is going to work. This is going to work. Swigert, Lovell, and Hayes assemble an identical version in space with just hours to spare. And all of a sudden, they see the level start to come down. I said, wow. The adapter is a triumph. Very good. <laughs> we felt exhilarated. We all love the lunar module. Two days later, when the astronauts splash down in the ocean, the engineers are elated. Thank God three guys did not lose their life. It was nip and tuck all the way, uh, but it worked. I don't think I had a drink. <laughs> I could have used one, though. The lunar module hasn't only performed far beyond its design limits. It has rescued the crew of Apollo 13 from certain death. In 
In all, six lunar modules land 12 men on the moon. The last three each transport a lunar rover. Allowing the astronauts to travel over 90 kilometers of the lunar surface. In total, they spend over 72 hours exploring this alien world. In 1972, Harrison Schmidt and Eugene Cernan are the last two astronauts on the moon. Humans haven't returned since then. But now scientists have the moon in their sights once again. In 2009, NASA launches an unmanned satellite called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO. Carrying a high-resolution camera, LRO is revealing the moon in unprecedented detail. Exploiting resources at the lunar poles may offer challenges for future generations of engineers. As lunar scientist Paul Spudis believes. One of the interesting things we found about the poles is it's sort of a unique environment. It has areas that are lit more than half of the lunar day. You can generate electrical power in order to create sustainable human presence on the moon. Engineering giant solar panels would provide the power needed to build lunar bases. And mining water frozen in lunar rock could provide the hydrogen and oxygen fuels to propel future rockets. Turning the moon into our first off-planet refueling station. So we're going the next step. We're going to sort of the exploration stage. Think of it as an early mining town. While it's been mapping the moon, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is also revealing remnants of Apollo's legacy. Lying silently on the moon's surface. I have six engines sitting on the moon. I wish I could see them, but I know they're all up there. They'll be there for a million years. These are the indelible reminders of a generation of engineers who dared to explore another world and succeeded. <laughs>